Thank you very much. Um, the famous paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould once said this. Thank you. If we would start the Earth's tape anew, would intelligent creatures again evolve? If other worlds share our basic chemistry and conditions, has intelligence arisen on them? So these are questions about probabilities and conditions. So what are the relevant conditions to develop intelligence? And what are the chances that they, are occur they occur in the universe or on our planet? This was said in the 80s, as you see. And in the 80s, we only had one intelligent creature on Earth, and that was us, the Homo sapiens. But since then, we have had a tremendous uh, development in animal cognition research. So today, we know better. We know that there are at least several other species that could be called intelligent. And this actually opens up the opportunity to answer Gould's question one day. And this is what I want to talk about today. I work with uh, crowbirds and great apes, mainly ravens, chimpanzees, and orangutans. And the raven is not dead, he's playing. <laughs> I study their cognition, their intelligence. I study their the architecture, how it's constructed, how they negotiate their worlds with their cognition. And as you know, these animals are very smart animals, and they very often outsmart our experimental designs, but that is good for my students and me, we keep on the edge. <laughs> but actually, there are more animals out there that could be regarded as intelligent. For example, some species of parrots and dolphins, and there are some other candidates knocking on this uh, exclusive club, clever club for animals like for example, elephants and some other marine mammals, but they have not been so thoroughly studied yet, so I'm being a bit conservative here. What's interesting about these uh, groups of animals is that they are very similar in their complex cognition, in their social intelligence and in their physical intelligence. They are highly similar, so similar that they have even been dubbed cognitive cousins. They appear to be related cognitively but they're very far away related when it comes to biology. Uh, actually, a raven could in some sense be said to be closer to a chimpanzee in its complex cognition than to its closest living outgroup relative. When I was preparing this talk, I started with writing a list over all the similarities in the complex cognition that these animals have, and then I realized this is just too technical. And then I thought once more, and then I realized these animals can be described as TEDx animals, actually. <laughs> Technology. These animals have the most advanced physical and technical cognition. They understand their physical surroundings in a way that is very uncommon among animals. Entertainment. These are the most playful animals on Earth. And play is very serious business. We know that today. We know that complex play correlates with advanced cognition. We don't know why yet, but we know that this is the case, and these are the most playful animals you will ever find. Design. These are the most innovative animals on the planet. They come up with uh, new solutions to old problems, solutions to new problems, and they constantly adapt to their surroundings. And what about the ideas then? Well, these animals also find the ideas worth spreading. They are the most cultural and social of all animals on the planet. They spread their knowledge from generation to generation. For example, their innovations go from generation to generation. Different populations of these animals have different cultures. And they are so social and so good at reading each other's behaviors and the behaviors of others that they could be called political animals, actually. What about the X, the independence? Well, all of these groups have evolved these features independently. I would like to give you one example of this apparent similarity, and I would use uh, the physical domain, the cognitive physical domain. Uh, I will show you two movies here on 
studies on an orangutan and a, or on orangutans and rooks made by Mendes and colleagues in Bird and Emery. These two animals are confronted with a apparently similar problem. A piece of food floating uh, on the surface of, the, of water in a transparent tube, but out of reach. And this is how they solve it. And remember, these animals are not trained on this. This is their spontaneous way of solving it. And also note this, the speed. And these two individuals, they are not freak geniuses. This has been replicated in many individuals. And I guess that several of you are right now thinking, oh, I wouldn't come up with that. And that's true. <laughs> Humans are not so good at this. Uh, I've tested it several times, mainly on, on, on journalists and politicians. No one has solved it yet, but they might not be the best representatives of Homo sapiens. I don't know. I would like to remind you about that intelligence is, act is actually a very human-centered concept. What we find intelligent is, of course, what we find similar to us. Uh, and usually, in science, such subjective notions or centered notions are not good. But in this case, if we're looking for extraterrestrial intelligence, it wouldn't pose a big problem. Because if we wouldn't find that extraterrestrial intelligence intelligent, we wouldn't see it. So that is the case. And that is why it must be similar to us in some sense. However, there are some uh, objective measures that we have in common with these animals. And that's uh, um, a huge relative brain size. We have a much larger brain size than is expected from our body size. And to your left you see a mammalian brain, and to the right you see a bird brain. And what is interesting here is that the forebrain of birds and mammals are radically different. The forebrain of a mammal is laminar, it's layers on layers. And the bird brain consists of densely packed nuclei. And you also see that the mammalian brain is a bit convoluted. Despite this, we come up with the same type of smart behavior. That's one of those fascinating things. To understand why they have different brains, I have to show you their history, a very, very brief history of these animals. This is a stem amniote. An amniote is basically an animal, an animal that can lay eggs on land. This is our last common ancestor with the birds, the reptiles, and the mammals, 300 million years ago. And then, about 230 million years ago, the first dinosaurs occurred. 200 million years ago, the first mammals occurred. And then, around 150 million years ago, the first birds occurred on Earth. And birds are avian dinosaurs. So if you think that the dinosaurs are extinct, think again. The last common ancestor of apes and dolphins lived around 95 million years ago. And the last common ancestors, ancestor of crowbirds and parrots lived 92 million years ago. And here we are today, cognitive cousins, very similar to one another in our thinking, understanding the world in a similar way, understanding one another in a similar way. I want to put this perspective from a different angle. This is a sponge. And it represents the first animal ever on Earth. It's thought to have been a sponge-like creature. This is, of course, a bit adapted for your bathroom, and it's dead, but it's still a sponge. <laughs> and here, you have a much more complex animal, biologically much more complex. Between these two, we have 600 million years of evolution. It takes around 600 million years to go from a sponge to a Homo sapiens, at least at that time on Earth. But what is even more interesting is that here we have two cognitive cousins. As I said, they understand the world and each other in a very similar way. But between these two, we also have 600 million years of uh, evolutionary processes. They had their last common ancestor 300 million years ago, 
So they have evolved separately, 300 million years and 300 million years, and that adds up to 600 million years of separate evolutionary processes. Apart from being interesting in itself, it also says that the thir first 300 million years were probably quite important. I will give you one idea about how we work with this to come up with what an extraterrestrial would think like and how these principles look like. When something occurs several times in evolution, independently, it's usually called convergent evolution or parallel evolution, and flight here is a, is a prime example. It has evolved several times during evolution. Here we have the mammals, birds, insects, and the reptiles. They are now extinct. All fly. They have evolved this independently of one another. But what they all have in common is that they must adhere to the principles of flight, of course, like aerodynamics and gravity and so on. Suppose that we didn't know anything about the principles of flight, then we could compare these animals, the differences and the similarities, and then we could produce a quite good sketch for the principles of flight. So this is what we want to do with complex cognition. Probably a little bit more complicated, but according to me, it should be doable. But this is obviously not enough. We need other perspectives as well. This is the tree of life as we know it today. These colored fields are actually not colored fields. It's very, very thin lines representing the lineage of families. And families are some steps above species. And this jagged black field outside is not a jagged black field. It's the names of these families. So you see that life is abundant on Earth. And this is where the last common ancestor of birds, mammals, and reptiles existed around 300 million years ago. And now I will show you where we find the sparks of intelligence. It's up there. The great apes, the dolphins, the corvids, and the parrots. When looking at the life of tree, we get a lot of um, ideas, of course, of the prerequisites for intelligence. For example, multicellularity seems to be important, of course. And the brain is, of course, important. And here on Earth, warm-bloodedness seems to be important as well. But what I find most interesting is that you see that these lines, they are around 20 million years long. We have found that these animals, their brain sizes enlarged at the same time, independently of one another. After four billion years, they just pop up with this big brain size around 15 to 20 million years ago. That was during Miocene. During Miocene, a lot of things happened. That's true, a lot of uh, those animals that we see today evolved during Miocene. But we have not seen such big brains somewhere else evolve at this time. This is ongoing research, but it might suggest that this is the cradle of intelligence, that Miocene is the cradle of intelligence on Earth. But we still don't know what this cradle is made of, of course, and if you want to put something in a cradle, you first need an embryo. And we don't know much about that embryo either. I would like to end with showing you the latest findings on exoplanets, planets outside our own solar system. This was published by NASA last week. They found several Earth-like planets, rocky planets, not much larger than Earth that you see on your right, and they're orbiting around their stars in the so-called habitable zone. I would guess that the universe is packed with planets like this. And I can't do the maths up here, but uh, if we consider that here on Earth, we have one instance of life, one origin. And in that origin of life, we have at least, we will probably find more soon, at least four independently evolved instances of intelligence. So my guess is that if the universe favors life, it should favor intelligence. As you understand, we have a tremendous work ahead of us. And, but I promise I will return to you as soon as I have any good answers. This might be in 50 years or so, but I dare to guarantee that you will hear about it when we have them. Thank you.